another episode of Clubrid and Clubroid Radio. Uh, this is Zach, and as always, Matt is here as well. And we're going solo on this episode. Um, we thought it would be cool to follow up the brumation episode with a, a reproduction episode, a breeding episode. So we're going to kind of keep our theme of hardcore biology and experience. Uh, so this episode might sound a little bit like a good old-fashioned lecture, if you will, but... Um, I know there's people interested in this stuff because they've reached out to both of us. And so the, the kind of goal today is to go over the biology first and get it out into the ether and then kind of take that biology and attribute it to keeping strategies and breeding strategies specifically. So before we get into that, though, we'll do a quick update because this is also going to be a short episode because both of us have to bounce. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, my update is that the last episode, I told everybody I was going to Costa Rica the next day, and my flight was canceled with that big cancellation that happened in Southern Florida. I was laying in bed trying to go to sleep and got a text, and it basically said, you're not going to Costa Rica. So I am now going to Costa Rica tomorrow, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, so didn't get to do that trip, but in the meantime... Having the nine days back and nobody knowing I was around gave me the opportunity to throttle down on the book. And dun -dun -dun, I turned in the book yesterday to the editor. So the book has been turned in. I think I'm up to I'm over 200 photographs from uh, 15 different photographers. Those have all been acquired. So this thing may actually come to fruition. And it feels really weird um, to turn it in. Anybody that's written the thesis, dissertation, paper, report, anything like that, the days after you turn it in, you have that weird, I've got to work on this thing feeling, but you can't because it's done. And my brain's not accepting that it's done. And it's actually far from done. We've got to do revisions and stuff like that. Um, other updates, I got, we have lots of snakes locking at the university. And uh, one of my graduate students, Taylor Hartman, with her thesis looking at what what temperature we cook eggs, does that really impact neonate size when they hatch? Hopefully, they now lay the eggs after all the locks we've seen. And um, yeah, we're good to go on that front. And then I have a my third false water cobra female. I think she's in her pre-lay shed right now. Um, falsies are weird. They like swell up, and we'll talk about this in a minute, with ovulation swells like boas and pythons, and they look huge. And then right before they lay their eggs, you just kind of stand there and look at them and think, are you pregnant? Are you not gravid? What the hell's going on here? And I'm doing that whole dance right now. But I know that she's gravid uh, because when she did her ovulation swell, she was bigger than my hand in diameter. So, um, yeah. So it's an exciting time. Semester's coming to an end. Me leaving the country. Everybody does that. That's good and smart. <laughs> there won't be any chaos in my life over the next two weeks. But anywho... That's me. What's up with you, Matt? <clears throat> oh, man. I mean, we talk about travel. I'm still on the road uh, traveling with one of our mobile laboratories this upcoming week with my new uh, hire in Indiana. So it'll be real good for him to get some hands on with some of our pieces of equipment. Um, you know, one of the cool parts about science is learning about applications and learning about discovery. So will be a very resourceful week in terms of learning about customers' needs as well as trying to help them as well. Um, but other than that, you know, inside of the collection here, um, you know, we pulled a few eggs already for the year. Uh, some cocci eggs have been put into the incubator. Um, also found over the last two days while digging through some enclosures, doing some cleaning before traveling, um, two clutches of eggs from tricolors, which I kind of fell back into, <laughs> yeah. so, um, you know, it's funny too, cause the animals came to me originally as a pair and ended up being two females. So ended up picking up a male and, and going through that process, but, um, be nice to see some little snouts here in yeah. a couple of months too, as well. Um, other than that, I mean, a lot of things are gravid or in the process of cycling, you know, with the weather and barometric pressure now kind of stabilizing or triggering some of those uh, events mm -hmm. of which we'll talk about today. Um, you know, it's an exciting year. It's also a scary time of year too, as well, because when you start thinking about hatchlings and um, animals, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, 
ethically, you want to make sure that if you are breeding animals, that you're breeding animals for the right reasons, as well as making sure that if you are going to do this, that you have the respective time and commitment for all of those animals. Um, so it's one of those things where I've played this year in terms of pairings and selections, just because of my travel schedule this year to kind of enhance some of the different lines of which I'm working with, as well as looking at animals and trying to make sure that the appropriate actions were taken care of. That also being said, you know, one of the interesting parts is looking at certain species and not every animal breeds in the springtime, right? So right now we have the Vietnamese mandarins as well as the Mullendorfi just now starting to cycle. So it'll be a fun, interesting time for those animals because they lay typically towards the end of the season and hatch towards the end of the year. So nice. But other than that, it's been just chaos, right? Yeah. The good chaos as well as bad chaos. Yep. Um, but other than that, it's been fun. You know, this is kind of our relaxing time of the week to record and yep. sit down and just talk snakes and biology. Yeah. So let's let's jump on that. So yeah. Thing we're going to do this is uh, we're going to basically throw the biology out first, get it up on the table, and then kind of take that biology and work it into the uh, the keeping strategies. So most of what we're going to be talking about today with the breeding is going to be very female centric in that we're going to talk about the reproductive cycle of the female, um, get some terms that people may have bumped into and not had the luxury of having defined, defined, and then kind of frame this in a, an ecological evolutionary context. And then once we get that done, we'll jump into how this is actually directly applied. So one of the things I wanted to discuss is this whole idea of the telegenesis. The telegenesis is uh, an aspect of the life history of females and pretty much any organic life form that is a eukaryote, multicellular, is going to undergo a telegenesis if an egg, also known as an oocyte, is being fertilized. And so the process of the telegenesis is the yoking up of the egg. And that might be an oversimplification. But basically, embryos need food to grow and mature and undergo their development. And they get that food from mom. And mom gets that food from her food in the form of proteins and lipids. So one way to look at this is yoking of eggs. And it's basically the, the concept of the telegenesis is such where there's a physiological pathway where proteins and lipids that are acquired through the female eating are kind of taken up into uh, the body via the bloodstream and other physiological pathways that are way too complicated to talk about on a fun podcast because everybody would go to sleep. And ultimately... Um, they're diverted into the ovaries, and then they're they're absorbed into the uh, oocytes. And with the telegenesis, there's kind of two types of the telegenesis. There's what we call um, pre uh, primary and secondary. And so what ends up happening is basically there's a little bit of action with primary. The eggs are in the ovary. They then are ovulated. They drop down into the reproductive tract at this point. And this is for ectotherms now. This is not what goes on in you if you're a human. And then um, once they get down into the reproductive tract, that's when secondary vitelogenesis is going to occur. And that's when these eggs are going to start to really swell. So when we talk about follicles and the follicles growing, what's happening as they are building is basically this secondary vitelogenic pathway. All righty? So... With that being said, then, uh, an important aspect is when does this occur inside the female? And what's kind of interesting is there's been two forms of vitelogenesis identified as far as when you have the, um, the, the major yoking of the eggs. And so we have what's referred to as prenuptial vitelogenesis. And this is what happens basically with snakes that are coming out of brumation so that we we and we'll talk about cycle feeding here in a minute so we cycle feed the females we give them a bit of energy going into brumation they go down for brumation they then wake up they've got that energy there and then they start eating like crazy as they eat like crazy that's going in 
you know, the, the food's going in the mom, the pathways are undergoing, and those follicles start to build. And then usually what ends up happening is you see an increase in ovary size, and then mating occurs, and then that triggers the ovulation, the, those big follicles drop down in. The other idea here is post-nuptial uh, vitelogenesis, or type 2, and what happens here is follicles enlarge after egg laying through the fall. So what happens is basically mom lays her eggs and then immediately undergoes the process of yoking up her next batch, which, are which should in theory happen 12 months later. And so when we do our cycle feeding and you start feeding heavy at the end of summer, going into the fall, what's happening is you're building up the female's fat bodies um, so that when she goes into into brumation she's got those fat bodies she comes out of the out of brumation and then she's got those those reserves to then immediately yoke up the eggs it's not necessarily associated with feeding out of brumation um so that's kind of part of this and the, the most important thing to understand is it's not a black white system so it's not that some have prenuptial some have postnuptial there are snakes that do that but there's plenty that are kind of a continuum they do they have more of a postnuptial strategy, but there's a prenuptial element associated with that. Or they have a prenuptial strategy, but there's definitely a postnuptial element associated with that. But this is literally the biological justification behind cycle feeding. Because what you're basically doing is for both strategies, you're prepping the girls for when they come out of that brumation period. They've got the fat store, so they're ready to go. So... Any comments on that, Matt? Sorry for the... No, you know, I, I think relative of this, you know, it's important to also think about the feeding cycle as well as aspect. And, and this is something that a lot of people do need to be careful of, especially in the fall, is overfeeding too as well. Mm -hmm. And it comes into being a, a relative aspect of moderation because while you are cycling the animal for brumation you do want to be careful in terms of having too much of a fatty reservoir yep. available for the animal and with that it's also interesting because like you said i mean there really is no black and white system because some animals will actually ovulate during brumation mm -hmm. too as well and i've seen a few different strategies and and some of this aspect does kind of fall back into natural history too as well, because when we think about the survival of a species relative to dens or nests too as well with uh, cohabiting in terms of brumation style, that ovulation during the winter period could actually be helping in terms of the fertilization as well. Yeah, And, you know, when you really start to think about it, it's a very interesting cycle and something that we take for granted in terms of hobbyists because of the fact that it's not a black and white system. And, you know, we'll get into this too as well, I think, in terms of the conversation of um, sperm growth as in terms of development in the fertilization cycle. Absolutely. And you also have fall breeding snakes where they have sperm storage going into brumation. And then you have those in the same species, they ovulate during brumation. And then when they come out of brumation, you've got egg and sperm waiting in the oviduct. Then you get a fertilization that's delayed. You know, what the hell system is that? So, <laughs> so one thing I think is important um, is we don't need people turning into keyboard warriors when they hear this. These are just basic guidelines. It's not an absolute. Uh, and... This is evident by the fact that, you know, we talked about with the brumation episode that you have to brumate snakes. And then immediately we started hearing all the people saying, I don't brumate my snakes and I get reproduction. Uh, and you know, there's so much behind that that goes into this whole idea that we're talking about. So just understand these are generalities we're throwing out there. It's totally fun to think about. It's totally fun to think about your animal. And if you know this stuff, it's going to make you a better breeder because then you might be able to figure out why you're not getting a fertilization event even though you saw umpteen locks or, you know, something to that effect. So, all right, cool. Next thing I want to talk about, which I think is really cool, and it's along the same line, 
is the concept of an income breeder versus a capital breeder. And, and this is classic life history biology. Uh, this is a concept that's not necessarily just associated with snakes. Uh, it was initially written up about birds and in, uh, amphibians, reptiles, but um, it definitely applies to snakes. Uh, and once again, continuum. So there are species that are income breeders. There are species that are capital breeders. And there's plenty of species that have elements of both. So when, when you think about these ideas, think about where you put your money. And that's how I understand it. And that's how it's been explained to me in the past. So an income breeder relies on recent energy requirements to yoke up the eggs during that vitalogenic event. So basically what happens here is these would be the animals that have a bit of fat stored going into to brumation. They use some of it to get through the winter, but they have it waiting there. But then what they're going to do is come out of that hibernation event, start eating everything in sight. And as they're eating a lot of the fat and protein that they're acquiring through those post brumation meals are going to be in the case of girls directly related to eggs that they're going to ovulate. And then, you know, ultimately follicular development. So these are animals that basically the classic income breeder is going to be a snake that has to brumate and comes out and then breeds immediately after brumation. Another strategy is what we call capital breeders and capital breeders rely on energy stores gathered over time. So if you're a capital breeder, this is kind of like using money in your savings account. As you acquire money here, there and everywhere, you're putting it away for later so you can ultimately reap the benefit of it at a later point in time. So animals that might live in the tropics could imply a capital breeding strategy where they're you know, slithering around. They don't really have a winter time. Uh, and they get into a boom of food and they're able to eat it and sequester it, you know, and then later on they, they find a male mate and produce eggs at any point in time. But they could also, this strategy also could be utilized with animals that are, or snakes that are breeding in the springtime. Because if you think about after you lay your eggs, you might be slithering around and find a boom of prey, or you might have a boom bust prey cycle that's part of your biology. And the boom may happen way after you're ovulating and dropping eggs over your annual cycle. So you basically feed heavily on whatever that prey is, maybe in the fall, um, build up your fat stores, and then you kind of go into winter ready to go for the spring. Uh, so income and capital breeding are pretty cool. And they're related to the different types of vitalogenesis. So we see income breeders are normally associated with like a prenup, prenuptial vitalogenesis type one system. Capital breeders are normally going to be affiliated with a post-nup type two system. So, uh, yeah, you know, this is the kind of stuff that when I look at that makes things like corn snakes incredibly interesting. Because if you just look at a corn snake and you get hung up on the fact that it's a common animal and it's dare I say just a corn snake, and I don't think that, you know, you're going to get bored. But if you know the biology, and now you can look at that corn snake and say, was it an income breeder or a capital breeder? And how does my understanding of that make me a better herpetoculture guy or gal? You know, this is what kind of adds structure and, and, and levels of magnitude to your keeping, in my opinion. No, I agree entirely. I mean, some of this stuff, when you really start to take into consideration and really look at these aspects, and I think, you know, I think we're trying to propose and, and really kind of present these ideas to, to help with that type of captive husbandry propagation by providing some of this information for our audience because we oversimplify things yes we do right and you know it it's not just a means of waiting for a shed cycle and introducing an animal because well maybe they're releasing pheromones you have all this other stuff going on yeah. in the background too as well there, there's so many triggers that go into that shed <laughs> And if you don't hit them all, you know, you're not going to get to that, that point. Um, and knowing this kind of stuff is going to help you hit the triggers uh, without question. Okay. And then the final concept is this idea, as far as breeding strategies, kind of a big 30,000 foot life history view of annual versus continuous breeders. So annual breeders are basically breeders that have are snakes that have a defined breeding season. And even here, 
you can be a biannual breeder or an annual breeder. So there's lots of species. All right, Japanese rat snakes are a great example of this. Uh, right now, my Climacophora are in the garage, and the, the male will not leave the female alone. And we are full-blown, came out of brumation, breeding, 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 breeding. And, uh, and at, at some point in the next two weeks, a switch gets flipped, and he just stops. I kind of keep my animals communally in a great big enclosure. Uh, and so he'll lose interest. And then September, October, when it starts to cool down again, but it's not getting like super cold, boom, he's back at the breeding again. Uh, so that would be, and they are animals that have been reported in the wild, having a May, a spring breeding season and a fall breeding season. But most of the breeding activity occurs in the spring. So that's basically annual, you might think of as seasonal. The others, so you see that in temperate snakes, snakes that have to deal with winter, essentially. Uh, what's interesting is there's also what we call continuous breeders. And continuous breeders, just don't overcomplicate it. They are animals that when a male finds a female, any month of the year, reproduction can ensue. So right off the bat, you'll think tropical species because we have a 12-hour light-dark cycle. There's no real winter. And don't fall into that trap necessarily because you can have annual breeding strategies and tropical snakes if they occur in an area where there's a wet season and a dry season because you got to understand the tropics that's it's not the same by winter as winter and summer but winter is a season of you know lean opportunity and summer is a season of boom opportunity the wet season is the usual boom opportunity season and the dry season is your lean season uh but what's Kind of cool is a lot of the snakes that I keep, um, the Dipsadids or Xenodontines from South America, the False Water Cobras, Barons, Racers, Museranas, Tricolor Hognose Snakes, those are great examples of continuous breeders. So anybody that's bred False Water Cobras knows you can brumate them, and I do brumate them, but I don't even know if it's really a brumate. I just turn the heat off and let them drop like five degrees, but you certainly don't need to do that because anytime you put a male with a female, he's going to try to mate with her. Well, why is that? Because they have a continuous mating, mating system. If you put corn snakes with a male corn snake with a female at the end of July, there's a high likelihood that he's not going to try to mate with her. Why? They have an annual mating system. So understanding these concepts coupled with income versus capital breeding, coupled with type one, type two vitalogenesis, you put this whole thing together and then you look at your species and that's how, from a biological point of view, you might generate a breeding protocol or a breeding strategy or what the hell you're going to do to get eggs. So yeah, those are the kind of big life history strategies before we get into the biology of ovulation and all that kind of stuff. But do you have anything to add to that continuous annual piece? No, you know, and some of this can even be further complicated too as well, because if we really start to think about it, some animals from a naturalistic aspect will not breed annually either. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, you know, herpetoculture, animals themselves technically aren't cycling every year yep. either. So you'll sometimes, and this has been posed in many different um, scholarly articles, is do animals in a temperate climate come out of bromation every year? Um, some people have even played in the hobby with brumating animals for a whole year, even too as well, and keeping them down for that time to actually experiment with some of the cycling. And that's been done with corn snakes as well as hognose too as well. Mm -hmm. So it really comes into an aspect of within the life history cycle of animals is this ovulation period occurring naturally each year and even to an ascent of that is the fertilization aspect that we'll start talking about in terms of ovulation you know is part of the reason why we see infertility also a aspect of cycling annually um, maybe not in terms of the animal's natural history in terms of biology with reproduction because even from field history notes, you'll find that you don't necessarily find many infertile eggs with clutches that are found 
in the mm-hmm. wild that have hatched. Yeah. And, and, and with these life history strategies, not every female is going to reproduce in a given year. Uh, that's exactly what you're, you're getting at. Um, we expect all of our females to breed if we're putting them through this process, because that's what breeders want to have happen. But biologically speaking, out in nature, uh, there's a certain percentage of females that don't go. Uh, there's certain certain species of snakes. It seems like the females only reproduce once every two or three years. A great example outside the confines of our group, uh, rattlesnakes, timber rattlesnakes in particular. That there's been plenty of studies that show that once a female reaches adulthood, she's probably going to have, depending on where she is in the country, she might have, if she lives to be 20 or 30 years old, she might only have three or four clut- or litters during that, that time period. Uh, uh, we've studied Nerodia, Cipidon, common water snakes at West Liberty. They're down in the, they're, that, they're part of that queen snake study. And what's really interesting is when I was a student there, the stream was in a lot better shape. And I could, I didn't have any problem in August finding big, burly, gravid females and then bringing them back to campus and then having them drop the litters and getting the data on the babies. I gave my students the opportunity to do that over the past couple of years. And they've had a hell of a time finding gravid females, but we find females all the time. And I got involved thinking, oh, kids. I'm going to go and find all these gravid females and show you all up. And sure enough, I didn't. So something's happened in that population, uh, which is, you know, impacting it. And from a science point of view, it could just be that those snakes are so aware of our presence because we're always in that creek that they've gotten savvy to us. And it could be that they're on a normal reproductive cycle and they just see the college students and I coming a million miles away and they're able to avoid capture or it could be something's gone down in the stream and that could be whatever, you know, whatever's gone down that Creek could be eliminating the fat stores, which is keeping them from ovulating. It could be the crazy climates that we've had lately. You know, there's all these things, but even in a, a given population can, can undergo the changes you were talking about. So let's just dive into quick biology. <laughs> um, that, you know, that what we just talked about is life history biology. This is just, what the hell's going on with an ovulation? Um, where does fertilization happen? What triggers the, the egg falling down into the uh, oviduct so that it can ultimately be fertilized? So with snakes, it's a bit different than the way it, it, that this all goes down with humans. Um, it, it, that's to be expected. They're freaking reptiles. We're mammals. Uh, but basically, when you have the snake's mate, uh, what ultimately needs to occur is a fertilization event. For you to get the offspring. So what are the triggers for that? Well, the first thing is the females have to develop follicles and then they have to undergo the process of ovulation and release the follicles from the, the oocytes from the ovary down into the oviduct so that they can ultimately be fertilized. And so a big question then is what triggers that process? And with our uh, continuous breeders, There's all kinds of things that can trigger that process. Um, With our annual breeders, same deal. Annual breeders, it seems to be seasonal. It can also be related to food. But what seems to be important is the actual action of mating. So there's a lot of evidence that points towards females having the oocytes ready to drop or dropping the eggs to the upper part of the oviduct. And then you have a mating event. And then that's what then triggers the whole process. There's hormone responses. There's physiological things that go on with sperm entering the oviduct and the, the there being um, markers or not markers. Uh, I can't think of what the hell they're called. Uh, receptors. There we go. That basically pick up the proteins associated with the sperm that then might trigger a pathway to say drop eggs. Uh, but basically what's going to happen is those eggs are going to be dropped down in the, the oviduct. They're going to be fertilized. Uh, when they are dropped down into said oviduct, the sperm is waiting for them there. But what, what's been really interesting, and I learned this writing the book, is that lots of species of snake, females in particular, well, the females are able to store sperm. And they store sperm in two very different places. Uh, they store sperm in what basically constitutes uh, what we refer to as, it means basically the vagina. They have a cloaca, but then that leads to 
you know, the, the cloaca is where the gut and the reproductive system have their commonality. But then you get up past that and you actually have the vaginal space. And so the sperm's released there. Lots of sperm will go up into the oviduct seeking out eggs, but some of the sperm actually hangs out in the mucus that's associated with the vagina and it just stays there. And then other sperm goes all the way up um, to the end of the oviduct and hangs out in this area uh, where the eggs are going to be immediately entering the oviduct from the ovary. And that's another area where they, uh, where the sper sperm is stored. And I have that term in my notes here, and I can't freaking find it. Um, I think it's called the inf infindibulum, but I could be wrong on that. And so when you have a reproductive event with a snake, what you have to understand is there's sperm in there that's going to fertilize the eggs that are being dropped immediately. But many species of snake have a strategy where there's other sperm that has no interest in going straight to the eggs, and it basically ends up being uh, sequestered in various parts of the female's reproductive tract. Why are we talking about this? Because this is what leads to our good friend uh, double clutching. And when it comes to double clutching, this is can be a hotbed topic <laughs> in herpetoculture because there's some evidence. There's there's one camp that basically says you don't want to double clutch your females. Uh, because if you double clutch your females, you're going to burn them out and they're going to live shorter. And then there's another camp that basically says if they've got the fat stores, they have the biology, they're, they're going to do it anyway. We might as well let it happen. And the reality of this from a science point of view, this is not my opinion. This is the science. Is there some snake species that double clutching is the norm? It's part of the biology. There's other snake species where it's not the norm at all. And it has everything to do with where you live. If you live in a tropical environment that has a lot of productivity and there's a tremendous amount of predation pressure, so you're going to drop a bunch of babies and there's predators everywhere and those babies are going to get eaten, it makes a whole lot of sense for you to maintain your population to reproduce again in a given year if you can, because you're just, you have to basically get beyond that predation pressure so you can recruit into the population and maintain your species. And that is exactly what my guys, false water cobras, do. Uh, they reproduce, they double clutch every year. And if I feed them heavy to get them back up, those fat stores come up, that trigger happens, there's sperm in their reproductive tract, and I'm going to get another clutch egg. It's just the way it works. Uh, same, but with hognose snakes last year, uh, they store the sperm uh, just like the um, false water cobras did. I fed them fed them trying to get them back up to weight because we all hate the way females look when they drop all the eggs and they look just horrendous. And those animals double clutched. And I'm not saying that this isn't good for all hognose snakes. I'm simply saying that the two females that I had didn't make it. Like they laid that second clutch of eggs and I had a hell of a time getting food back into them. I fed them too heavy, I think, after they, they dropped. And then they ended up passing. And so this year I'm not going to restore them quite as much. So the, the point of this diatribe is some species of snake, it's part of their biology. Some species of snake, it's not. So to hemper colubrids like corn snakes and king snakes, uh, there's evidence from the literature when people catch these animals and they do like, they, they dissect them, they look for follicles. You don't normally see that in a corn and in a, in a, in a king snake. So it's not, it appears not to be a normal part of the biology in nature for corn snakes to double clutch. That being said, if they have the resources to undergo vitellogenesis, so you give them all the food, their fat stores come back, they've got the sperm there, that's going to trigger a double clutch event because in nature, that would be equivalent to the one year in that corn snake's life where the voles are everywhere and she doesn't have to work to find her prey and she's having a banner year, she gets a lot of prey items and then she gets the fat stores back. She's going to double clutch. That might happen one time in her lifetime. May not happen ever in her lifetime. May happen multiple times in her lifetime. The truth is we don't know because we're not out there looking. Um, so double clutching, I would say the verdict's out. I would not say that, you know, we, we should say it's horrible or we should say it's wonderful. I just think we need more data. That's my opinion. And it's No, I agree. With, yeah. Well, and... You know, it comes into the aspect of 
captive husbandry, number of generations in terms of captive reproductions, because some of these animals get more complicated in terms of an annual versus continuous breeding cycle too as well, because what we see is us providing the resources for those animals and that's providing the triggers based upon, you know, food cycling. Yep. We're actually food cycling the animals respectively of their breeding cycle and influencing things more repetitively. For instance, tricolor hogs in the hobby, yeah. you know, they will breed, as you mentioned, and breed, 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 um, and lay multiple eggs in a captive environment. But it could very well be the fact that this doesn't happen in a natural history cycle, whereby providing that many clutches in a season based upon the relative aspect of their natural history. Yeah. Are there any snakes that you could think of that are that shouldn't double clutch? Or what, what species have you had that have double clutched? Well, you know, it's interesting because if we talk about the relative aspects of double clutching and cycling of animals, we'll typically see some species that we don't have much natural history on, respective to file snakes, for instance. Um, it's not uncommon to find, it, it, from my perspective in the hobby, is I've had four to five clutches of file snakes in a season. Wow. And relative of that, we don't necessarily know what their natural history cycle might be. But, you know, looking at wild caught animals that have come in, most of them are very thin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we talk about their snake eating life cycle, but really they're a generalist in terms of their natural history. In respective of that, I think providing them with a higher fatty nutrient bound yeah. animal, such as a rodent, we're actually changing that natural history for that animal and even in a wild caught animal could actually be triggering it because of their temperate area zone. Right. I mean, respective of the subtropical areas within Africa, you know, going below the equator, they might not be cycling multiple times in a year, but because we were putting them and introducing them into a different cycle, you know, it is very common to see multiple clutches as well as the storage of sperm within file snakes and it likely has a very high um, impact in terms of their nutrient reserve as well as sperm storage as well as um, you know providing for those nutrients because that animal is just trying to exhaust those um, resources those energy yeah. storages so it's just cycling the animal um, you know some people have bred and receive three to four clutches of corn snakes even that's been documented mm -hmm. you know and it really comes into the play of maybe in terms of some of our our feeding strategies we could actually be manipulating the way in which bromation actually occurs and by influencing that you know once an animal has dropped their eggs we start to just load them up with food exactly and you know, we're just basically triggering and triggering and triggering. And it could also be pulling on the um, captive age of an animal, right? Because we're influencing those strategies and pushing them. You know, over the years, I've, I've put into some forums of the aspect of within Porphyracea, I don't brumate cocci or lettucinctus or um, pulcher. And it's not necessarily the respective aspect of um, trying to ovulate the animal or build up the egg base. But for some of those animals, when we really start to think about it, you have to be careful with the food cycling too, because you're basically going to exhaust the animal. Yeah. Um, no, I've, I've thought about that too. I agree with you 100% with the, when they, when they drop, drop the eggs. And then you start feeding the girls to get them back up to size. Um, and I'm guilty of this. I, like I said, I did it with the hognose snakes last year. Uh, they dropped, dropped their clutches. I was all excited. And then I was like, all right, we're going to feed you and get you back, you know, to where you need to be for next year. And uh, I, I just fed them too much. And I think that 
if they if I was feeding them toads, I wonder, at the same frequency I was feeding them mice, <coughs> would I have triggered that response? Because uh, with vitellogenesis, what we're after, what they, what they need is proteins and fats. And that is what a rodent is composed of. When you feed a frog or a toad, in the case of heterodon, that's the fat is a very different type of fat. It's also a very different type of protein. And so if I would have fed the same amount of, same mass of toad that I did mouse, would I have triggered the double clutching event? And would the snakes have, have made it out of that okay? Or would I have triggered a double clutching event and then the females would have been all right after they, they dropped the second clutch? Because I, I, I deeply feel in the case of those two females that I just essentially burned them out. I, they had the, the energy allocation of basically create yoking up and creating the first clutch. They, they then under, used all the energy to lay those eggs. I then gave them the rodents which they then had to utilize energy to digest. And then they stockpiled that energy, which in the form of all the fat that comes in the, in, in the adult mouse. And then that built those fat stores back up again. There was sperm there and then boom, well, we're just going to start this all over again uh, in a species of snake that may not normally do that. But like I said, you do that with a falsy, they're fine. All, all the data. So one of the ways that scientists figure out if species do double clutch is that they, they study females from museums. This is why it's a necessary part of herpetology to go out into nature, collect animals, um, sacrifice them and put them in a museum jar is sometimes somebody is going to then go to all the museums, look at that species of snake and dissect all the, you know, all the, the females of that species. And hopefully they'll get them every month. And if they get a nice series you can look at the follicles in the oviducts and actually see what the natural reproductive cycle is and what was really interesting while i was working on the book is that it seems like almost all of the xenodontine south american colubroids those things like mooses and falsies and tricolor hogs they there is evidence with those animals that they are double clutching most of them uh one the yellow-bellied Lyophis, which uh, at some point I need to get a damn male. I thought I had a male, and I have yet another female. But that's a species that has been shown to drop, like the tricolor hogs, nine clutches a year. Um, Yasser with Spitfire reptiles um, is the only person I know of who has a male. And he, I think he last year was up to seven or eight clutches of those things, and each one was nine to ten eggs. And that seems to be what they do in nature, too. Uh, so, you know, that's double, that's, that's laying eggs at an almost insane rate. Well, there's gotta be some reason for that, but like tricolor hognose snakes, I have wondered, do they lay as many eggs as they lay for us in human care? Because we've segued their diet in human, in, in human care to rodents and not what they're eating out in nature, which is amphibians. Cause we're just slamming them with a high lipid diet, you know? Is that restoring those fat stores so they can just clutch after clutch after clutch after clutch? Or is that what they do in nature? Because there was one study done with a close relative of Pulcher, uh, Xenodon matagroensis. It's in Brazil. And they saw evidence of like double clutching. They didn't see evidence of the insane number of clutches we get when we have them in human care. Well, in some of that, you know, it comes also to, and in, this is something I think people do need to, well, hobbyists in general need to play attention to is nutrients based upon the prey item. Mm -hmm. And this is something I think relative of offering adult mice versus weaned mice yep. versus fuzzies, because for instance, um, this is going back now several years, but I had an Arcalafe, which are still fairly uncommon within the hobby, actually go and double clutch and end up passing away during the double clutch cycle. And as it comes in conversation with a veterinarian in Germany, the relative aspect of egg binding too as well is more prominently seen because of the amount of nutrients of which we're providing and the high lipids as well, which would then be accumulated into fat storage. Yep. 
And at some point in time, we'll do a biology aspect of how fat is actually created within reptilia because it's a very different process from humans. But within that respective of those fat storages, they actually bound the ovaries and the yep. oviduct. And that actually was occurred because of the fact of feeding too heavily after the egg laying process. And that animal ended up passing away because it wasn't able to pass the eggs through the oviduct because it was basically restricted by the amount of fat of which is stored. So now it brings into a whole nother complication of should we really be feeding heavy fatty prey items, you know, like large mice or even retired breeders, because the only thing there is fat yep. in those animals. So I've, I've taken the approach now of feeding smaller meals to those animals after egg laying um, to help reduce some of that stress as well as build that body mass up respectively. You know, even just like in humans, you could eat a ribeye or you could eat a sirloin. Yeah. And the relative aspects between that is the amount of fat within that. Because at that point in time, we don't need that fat yep. after that egg laying process. So, you know, unless we're trying to differentiate the animal and try to grow and, and move towards multi-clutching, there really is no respective need for that excessive fat storage. Yep. Um, in some aspects, it may actually be biologically better to offer leaner meals for those animals afterward. And that recovery aspect afterwards may end up helping with the animal, you know, because as you mentioned, I mean, with the uh, falsies, you know, it's very likely they're not being, you know, exposed to that heavy nutrient meal afterwards and likely is going to restrict their, um, their follicular development during that cycle afterwards. Yeah. No, hundred percent. So the, the point of all this is it's, it's just complicated, but it's also fun to think about. So you know, it's, it's way too oversimplified, I think, when you're on a Facebook group and people start ra you know, railing towards each other and throwing bombs and all that kind of stuff through the keyboard. <clears throat> I, you know, I sit there and think about all this kind of stuff and uh, want to try to science my way out of that, you know, that argument. And I, 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 I've definitely gotten over the past year very interested in prey foods for captive snakes uh, i talk about my grad student pay all the time she's making sausages now she's basically making reptilinks but not making reptilinks and we're controlling the prey that's going into the sausage and you know we're offering these things to some of the snakes of the university and if you looked at them they literally look like little hot dogs and you're like there's no way that they're going to eat that and then the yellow tails eat them the false water cobras eat yellowtail crebos. The false water cobras eat them. I'm fairly certain if I offered them to Lampropeltas here, uh, they would eat them because I've got king snakes to the left of me right now that I I literally play the will you eat it game with a couple of the Florida kings that live in my office just to see what their dietary breadth is. And, you know, those things lose their mind. They get just as excited about tilapia chunks as they do mice. Uh, when I bring in the, it's funny now, when I bring the tilapia in here uh, to feed all the garters and the water snakes that are in here, these two Brooks Brooks, uh, Brooks kings start doing laps, just like the garter snakes. Um, so then that brings to light, like, I'm pretty sure the protein constituents of tilapia are more in line with reptile than old breeder mouse, which is what they they're, they're normally eating. So it's like, I feed that and now that we're doing these sausages i've literally thought what if you could just make your own prey and then maybe even come up with a diet that you feed the females afterwards so after they lay their eggs if you want to avoid that second clutch where you're you're feeding lean pro protein um and you're getting all the lipids out of there because that excess fat is what's going to the fat body, which then leads to the patellogenic event, which leads to the double clutch for the snakes, which may not necessarily be the best thing in the world. That's a whole other. Well, and we can even, <laughs> we can even complicate this even further and even talk about infertility within eggs itself, because mm -hmm. it may actually not even be respective of the fertility of the male or female. 
It could just be that the fact of the matter is, is we induced a trigger within our collections and that follicular moment was not within the cycle yeah. or the momentary gland. Um, you know, even you could go even more complicated and look at the anatomy of the animal and even start to think about the shell gland Yeah, and go into how these shell gland actually provides a momentary trigger for the calcification of eggs too as well. And, and could even create some aspects of triggers respective of nutrient deficiencies within prey items. Yeah. And maybe we're getting too deep. <laughs> we're getting too deep. So let's back this thing up <laughs> and then just go to kind of the actual action of herpetoculture. What's your process post brumation for breeding? So to kind of give some background here, when you, you look online and somebody asks, how do you breed? We'll just go back to corn snakes. Corn snakes. Some people will say there's us, there's like you put the male in with the female for two days, then you take him out for three days and you put him in there for two days. Other people say just throw the male in there until he's not interested with her anymore. Um, some people say wait until the animals do a post brumation shed. Other people say put it in immediately after brumation, and that's what elicits the post -bru or initiates the post brumation shed. So there's quite a few ways and before we get into the ways we're not saying any one way is the better way we're just simply talking about our ways so you know given that you have 700 freaking snakes in your house <laughs> and have way more breeding experience than me um what's your process when it comes to actually breeding your colubrids yeah so i this methodology has changed over the years now um and part of this has to do with keeping style. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do keep animals in racks, not to say that, you know, you should keep them in cages, racks, whatever. It's really kind of defined by the keeper style. Um, but with that being said, I do have um, within my room uh, full spectrum lighting. And I do trigger the lighting respective of that to cycle the animals respectively of there because you are still going to be getting light through a tub, mm -hmm. whatever anyone wants to say, um, you know, respective of holes, airways, anything of that nature, you, you'll still be cycling respective of that. So I do increase my light cycle in the spring to a 12, 12 on 12 off. Um, from there, typically the starting aspect for my style is I do have everything respectively on thermostats. And what I'll start to do is respective of the rows of which the animals are on, I'll start to warm the females up first. And I do that for several reasons. One is I want the female to start eating at a relatively um, more voracious appetite, if you will, trying to get those fat storages up yep. to par. Um, after about three weeks, I'll then start to warm the males up and I am very careful about warming males up because one of the things that you need to be careful of in breeding is getting the males too warm because that can actually decrease the sperm in the animal too as well and actually destroy the sperm. From there, I'll end up pairing animals immediately after formation. And I do that for several reasons, because obviously the female has already started to build up her food storage and some animals themselves will actually breed during brumation, which I've found interesting within Archilaphae too yeah. as well. Um, but within that, you know, I'll leave the respective pairings together, um, unless I'm feeding. So the male never leaves the female unless they're feeding. In which case I'll separate the animals and then leave separate for 48 to 72 hours, after which I'll reintroduce that male into the female. Now, my um, keeping style is very different from other herpetoculturists, and mm -hmm. that is because I want to have more males than females within my collection. And that is basically to induce um, a relative aspect of cycling males within females to actually increase competition okay because there is a relative aspect there too as well of which the males sometimes will actually try to 
overcome that female, and this is something that really isn't heavily documented, but by having multiple males, you're actually increasing the um, nature of which sperm and fertility might actually trigger a female during that ovulation cycle. Um, something of which, you know, depending on the species, unless we're looking towards genetic aspects um, in terms of morphs, you know, it, it is beneficial to have multiple males within a female. Now, with that, you have to be careful not to in introduce male to males sometimes because those males may kill each other, which is common in porphyracea. The males will actually combat and yeah. the respective um, stronger male will then breed with the female. Uh, after which that animal then may go through a shed cycle, continuously breed during that cycle. Um, but in terms of introducing females to males, I typically leave them together except for feeding. And once the animal then starts to go into their pre-lay shed, mm -hmm. at that point, then I remove the males. But I leave males together with females except for um, that time. So you go all the way to the pre-lay and then male balances. I do. Okay. And, and part of that is just to increase your chances, right, relative of that. Well, I wish I could say something different, but that's what I do. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> the the only the only time that I've kind of gone to the, the 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 three days on, two days off is at the university. I tell the students to do that, um, and it's more just it's more to keep the students engaged, so that basically they are interacting with the animals and if they're interacting with the animals then they're going to see if the animals are locked and we document all of that kind of stuff uh i i have so with my japanese rat snakes i did do something last year which was kind of interesting i don't know if it's just my japanese rat snakes but um my males are insanely aggressive breeders like they will not leave the girls alone and i had had two the two previous years uh no i both females laid beautiful clutches of slugs. I was like, what in the hell is going on? You know, I, I had males mating with females while they were had an ovulation swell. So I knew like all that stuff was going on. So last year I did a little bit of an experiment where I took one of the girls. I just left her in there permanently. And then the other female, I waited until I saw the swell. And last year was different than this year because I was home all of last spring. So I could do this. I saw a copulation during the swell. I pulled that female at that point in time and put her in a separate enclosure because I thought maybe all of the stress because they can't get away from the boys uh, that might be impacting some part of this because cortisol absolutely impacts reproductive success. And that was the female that ultimately dropped the clutch. But I'm certainly not saying with an N of one that, that that's what happened there. It could also have been that the female finally reached the age that she was actually, you know, dropping oocytes that could get fertilized and the male um, cycled properly. And there's so many variables that go into that, that, you know, but that being said, that, that was the female that dropped the fertile clutch. The other female left her in until the prelay shed, the boys lost interest and she dropped another slug clutch. So I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying that one worked over the other, but uh, yeah. Um, but other than that, I do what you do. I put the boys with the girls. I wait until I, I wait until I see a nice ovulation, and then, um, if the male stops showing interest in the female, then I'll pull him. But if he's interested, whether I've, I've I think I've missed a couple ovulations in the past by pulling the male too early, so I figure might as well just leave him there until the the prelay shed is done. That's what I'm doing right now. With I have a pair of black pine snakes in my garage right now that I've seen locked at least five times, but I'm not pulling that guy until uh, we have a prelay shed. So now I will say with false yeah, cobras, it... one more thing real quick, you do have to pull the male because they will, I've, I've never seen a snake that wants to breed like a male false water cobra. And if you have him with the female for like six days, I don't know what the math is on that, but like, He's trying to mate with her the entire freaking time. So he will exhaust 
Um, I, I get worried about the female. I might be anthropomorphizing there, but I'm pretty sure in nature the girls probably get away and they're in a cage. So I do limit them to, I guess there is a snake I do that with, uh, about five days together. And then, or sorry, I limit them to three days together. And then I pull the boys. So I guess there is one I do that with. Yeah, there, you know, within some of this, there is a monitoring of care, right? Because of the aspect, you do want to make sure that you are paying attention to physical cues. Um, because as you mentioned, you don't want to increase the cortisol stress on the animal. Um, because that could actually limit some of your fertilization mm -hmm. success and ovulation period. Uh, that being said, I mean, you know, if you're noticing unique features, um, if you were separating the animal just to feed, if the females aren't continuously feeding, it could be respective of that. And maybe it's time to give that female a break, respective of that male, or maybe just monitor that female separately for a while just to make sure that she is keeping weight on, respective yeah. of that. No, like, like this, this season was my first time breeding king snakes and everybody knows everybody's heard the horror stories of the one king snake gets eaten by the other king snake and i talked to quite a few people online that are well-known florida king breeders jen archer scott mcfarling you know people like that and just ask like what do you do like to avoid this snake eating snake thing and i guess you have this with your file snakes too um mm -hmm. and then with these experienced breeders they basically said you will have females or, or a male that just it's usually a female by the way which i thought was interesting that does look at the you know that in, intruder as food initially so you just simply sit there and watch initially but if you don't see a feeding response it's probably okay and so i'll fully admit leaving the pairs together at first was a little bit nerve-wracking but i didn't see any kind of indication with any of my animals that they were looking at each other like dinner um and in those cases, I did leave them together for a week at a time. And then I, you know, if anybody's kept Getchula Kings, that part of that complex, you know that as soon as a rat gets involved, all hell breaks loose. And the only time I had, um, I, I, I keep them in racks and I pulled the wrong tub. So what I would do is I would pull the tub where I had the pairs together and then take the male, put them in a separate tub, leave the female in the tub and then feed them together. And I got confused and i pulled out a tub that had both snakes in it and i had the rat at the end of the hemos and that was fun uh because the male grabbed the rat and the female went to grab the rat and she literally realized the rat's been grabbed by somebody else then she grabbed the male and then they all constricted like you know so there's something to be said about separating the damn snakes before you offer a prey item but that was the only to date that's the only time i've had any kind of attempted predation but even then it wasn't necessarily if i didn't have the rat there that wouldn't have happened well and you know one of the things i think respective of snake eating processes i do think that in some of those instances where a female may have ate a male i think some of it's actually induced upon stress mm -hmm. where the female just wants to get rid of the male and remove basically that male from her environment and I think that's what actually triggers some of those responses um, because the female may not be interested. The male might be courting the female. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it induces the aggression. Yeah. Which then leaves one snake <laughs> at demise. <laughs> yep, exactly. So once you get, um, do you, do you do any kind of record keeping with your locks? Uh, yeah. So, so I'm, I don't know. Everyone, I've seen a lot of conversation recently related to software programs, respective of, you know, record keeping for that. So I actually am a big fan of painter's tape. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> on the front of every tub is actually a um, piece of tape on the animal in which I'll put on there the respective associated number with the animal. Um, and on there is the respective males that have been introduced, the date that the introduction has started, whether or not I've started to introduce different males in the cycle. And then from there, if I am available and I am watching the animals respectively, I will record if I had seen a lock or an ovulation, 
um, because obviously you'd be able to see the physical swelling of the animal. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll take note of a shed, the initial shed, pre-lay shed, um, those respective dates of which those animals have started that process. And from my personal perspective, this is what I do and may not be as um, lucrative as Clint with his uh, <laughs> note cards to the left or to the right yeah. and then the orientation of it. But what I'll end up doing is actually putting a piece of um, tape on the front of the respective tub or enclosure. And I typically put it horizontally when the animal is starting to go through a prelay shed. And once the prelay shed has been completed, I'll, I'll put it in the opposite direction to basically n- notify or record, obviously, that I need to start paying more attention to that animal. The other thing of which I think is important, but not necessarily super important, maybe, I don't know, um, is I'll actually start to modify the nestling box of which I'm introducing into the enclosure by actually increasing the respective humidity inside of their post prelay shed. And part of that I find personally is I think the extra moisture inside of that actually helps with the um, eggling process, basically to keep the moisture environment for that animal to then lay their respective clutch. I could be overthinking it, but I think that extra moisture helps just to help provide a more humid environment. No, that's what... I do the exact same thing. I we just bought a crap ton of sphagnum moss for school because we've got I don't know somewhere between ten and twenty females that are ready to drop, um, and and that's exactly what we do. Relay shed, the sphag goes in, a heavy mist. Uh, I've noticed last when I was really keeping records over the past three or four years, I had so many egg like clutches laid either two or three hours before a thunderstorm or one to two hours after the thunderstorm uh, that it was kind of eerie how things like, like great example. I think this was last year. We had a big low pressure system move through and within a 12 hour period of time, I had the hognose snakes lay Western hognose snakes lay eggs. Um, Boiga Saina, the green cat eyed snakes laid eggs. My Madagascar Ophis laid eggs, uh, and I had the um, my uh, Slowinski eye rat snake lay eggs. Those are snakes from like multiple continents, multiple evolutionary lineages. But I don't think it's an accident that that pressure system triggered the egg laying because all of them had done their prelay sheds, but they were all very different number of hours, days, whatever you want to count it, post shed. To have them all lay in that narrow window window is pretty freaking interesting. So it was a boom day. What I do to keep track of things this year, because this year has been the definition of insanity, is normally I'm like a psychopath with my data sheets and things, but I just, I get home and I'm exhausted. And But I, I, I also have that nagging thing in the back of my head is that I've just started taking freaking pictures. So when I see a lock... I just take a quick picture. Um, it is it is a way to go through my phone and be like, okay, you know, there was a lock on Tuesday, April 1st at 7.13 p.m. And then I also have taken pictures. This is how lazy I've gotten this year. Um, I, I, I've taken pictures of the prelay sheds. So I know, all right, you know, she's dropped, she's, she's done, done the shed. Um, and I'm actually, because I'm going to Costa Rica and I have all these animals that are about to lay, uh, we were talking about this before the show. I've moved a bunch of females up to school. Uh, so hopefully they'll be dropping their eggs. That's also has me a little bit horrified because I'm, I'm secretly scared to death that moving them from their enclosure to another enclosure while gravid may cause them a little bit of undue stress, but I might also be overthinking that. And it was nothing like overly sensitive. We're talking about king snakes for crying out loud. Uh, But at the same time, maybe not the best practice, but yeah, that's how I've been doing record keeping this year. Normally I have my, my data sheets that I keep um, 
that I would just put all that information on the, on the sheet. Yeah. You know, it's funny too, um, mentioning pictures over the years, I used to post, um, pictures to the Facebook page or Instagram when I did see locks. And part of that was actually for record keeping yes. purposes, <laughs> um, which is interesting because a lot of people would say, do you, why are you, um, interrupting the animal during the breeding cycle? Aren't you worried? Blah, blah. No, it was really just for my record keeping, just mm -hmm. keeping track which mail had locked and yep. and then I can go back and look at, you know, what was the date of this day when they did lock, egg lay, and it puts together a complete picture. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So when a benefit of Facebook. Yes, a benefit of Facebook. <laughs> keeps you from being crazy. That's basically what I've done with Instagram this this year. Same thing. Um so when we'll talk about egg care and incubation and all that stuff later, but do you, when the eggs are laid, what's your process of harvesting the clutch? Um, is it just simply going in? Do you give the girl a day or two to chill? Do you see the eggs and immediately grab them to get them in the incubator? Um, what's your, what's your strategy there? Yeah, so my process is a little bit different, I think, than others. And and some of this has to do with travel cycles, too, as well, is typically, I typically wait a day from which the animal has either finished laying her eggs, because at that aspect in time, a lot of stress has been undone to that animal. And that animal is respectively resting at that point in time. And pulling the animal too quickly, respective from those eggs, can create a number of issues, respective of that. So, and that's just for the biology of the female itself, for her health. Once I've actually removed the female from her nest box, and typically I'll use a hook mm -hmm. um, just to reduce stress, try to get the animal off of it. And I'll take that female then, and I'll actually take some Dawn dish soap and wash the animal to remove any sort of scent of the eggs from that female. Because sometimes the female will not start feeding afterwards. And some of that may have a part to play with the scent of the eggs that of which she's still um, thinking that she's surrounding, right? Because some animals will stay with the eggs. Um, some will leave them. So I do find that to be very resourceful um, in terms of taking that female and, and rinsing her of any sort of uh, secretion. From that point in time, I do take, and depending on the clutch itself, I'll take perlite and I'll take perlite and I'll use water. And I do the shake and bake method of okay. not measuring anything out and basically just soaking the perlite putting it in a container and then shaking the respective container to make sure that, that all the perlite is set up associated and then drain any excess um, oh, cool. water from the container. Um, and I do that purely because of the fact that when you do weigh it out, sometimes it may not respectively be enough water inside of it. And really for that perlite, I think you just want it to clump up and hold its posture. Uh, from there, I'll actually take the clutch of eggs and I'll actually separate the eggs mm -hmm. from the respective um, clutch. You have to do so very, so gently or gingerly so that you don't rip any of the egg um, or the calcified aspect of it. And I'll bury the respective egg about a third of the way down in the perlite. And then I'll put dry perlite around the top okay. too as well. And I do that because from my sense and uh, theory, you don't want to get the eggs too wet because the egg itself is going to absorb yep. the water and grow. And during that process, sometimes the egg itself will, you'll actually start to see um, like hairline cracks respective of the egg because the egg has just absorbed too much moisture. From my perspective, it's better to add a little bit more water to the respective uh, incubation box rather than have it too wet. And in that respect, I do have air holes okay. in all of the respective um, incubation boxes. 
And I, I believe that's very important because the egg is breathing too as well. Yeah. And you are seeing oxygen um, exchange. So I don't think that you want to have a completely enclosed box where air exchange cannot occur. And then I take more painter's tape, put it on top of the container and write down the respective um, pairing, the date of which it's laid. And then depending on the species, I will put an expected hatch date on there and put it inside of the incubator. And then typically on the outside of the incubator, I have a post-it note or piece of paper that identifies what clutches are inside of there. Yeah. So I'm pretty damn similar. Uh, only difference I, so with hognose snake eggs, they're kind of notorious for, you can't, they will get, you can definitely get them too wet. And they will do what you were talking about where they absorb eggs and, or sorry, absorb water. And like, I mean, when you look at them, they look like they're about to explode. They're so, you know, plump. So we do use the, I forget what it's called. It's the plastic grid. Is it like, anyway, a plastic suspension. Grid. Yeah. Yeah. And we put it over top of the perlite and then kind of rest the eggs up on top of that. And then we'll shove toothpicks into the grid. Um, to just kind of keep the egg from rolling around a bunch. Uh, we, we Last year, we did do that with pretty much all of our eggs, minus, I think we, false water cobra eggs, I normally just put in the perlite. But um, I have definitely uh, ran into the issue of too much liquid. So when you're in the position I'm in, which is I'm teaching people, and you've got people who have never done this stuff before, uh, one thing that you learn as a teacher very quickly is that Many people take what you say with in a 100% literal way. <laughs> so a couple years ago, I had a graduate student and um, it was actually 2020, the year that we, that COVID hit and we weren't allowed to be on campus and we were fighting back and forth, having an animal collection and then being in charge of the animal collection and then being told you can't interact with the animal collection was more than a little bit infuriating but i basically had to do a lot of like we had bred the animals um and they the, the grad students were taken care of and i had told one of the graduate students that you know you want to make sure that the perlite is what is is moist we don't want it to be wet and then i got asked the question well how do i do that and i told her the ratio and what i had said was you kind of add water periodically if it dries out that was interpreted as we have to add water. So we had eggs and there was like a weekly dousing of water to the incubation medium. And when I got there, there was literal water in the bottom of the, like, you know how when you look at the perlite, you should see like spaces. These eggs were essentially floating in water. And if you have that situation, what's going to happen is uh, the eggs will get extensions that come off of them. I think, you know, and and that we had so many eggs that were like that. We we had bred ball pythons that year, and I looked at those ball python eggs and thought, "How in the hell are you going to catch? Going to hatch? You? <laughs> I mean, these things look like boots. They didn't look like eggs, but sure enough, they hatched. But that's when you get that crazy thing when you add too much water of the windows, um, and you can like look into the damn egg. Um, windowing, I've learned through firsthand experience is oftentimes associated with there being too much moisture in your egg in your incubation medium. So uh, B, I too, like you, lean more towards a little bit dry and add water than having them incubate in a damn swamp. The other thing that happens if you're incubating in a swamp is you are literally begging. You are begging for mold and fungi and all kinds of uh, bacteria to invade the clutch and that's when you end up with the wonderful purple eggs and the red eggs and the red and purple orange eggs so um you can definitely make these things a little too wet but you have to have the moisture because that's what leads to the gaseous exchange yeah one thing we we didn't point on or touch on um is some people will actually mark their eggs mm -hmm. respective of top or bottom um, i don't and over the years I'm going to admit to this. I've dropped eggs on the ground or rolled them after laying. Um, I personally don't think it matters. Um, I don't think it detaches. 
anything respective um, from the nuclei of which it's developing. But I know some people have personal thoughts on that. Um, my perspective is in the wild, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to get rolled. It's going to move. Um, I don't think, I mean, dropping eggs and hatching that same egg, I think is proof of concept. Yeah. That things will happen. <laughs> so no, it, there was actually a study that was done um, where they used um, one of the Natrix species. I think it was Natrix Mara, but I could be wrong on that. I make the graduate students read this study. And they asked the question of, does it matter, like the position of the egg in incubation? They weren't asking this for herpetoculture purposes. They were just asking it for embryology, science for the sake of science questions. And they found out that if you move the eggs at various points uh, up to like, there was a certain point where it did matter. Um, And that's just because of the embryonic development. But uh, in the first couple weeks it doesn't appear to matter that much the way that w- what happens inside the egg is the the embryo you have the fertilized um, fertilization event then you have what's called the zygote which is the whole undifferentiated ball of cells we're not to like an embryo yet but that's going to inevitably head towards the top now i said it heads towards the top i did not say it goes to the top sometimes they attach to the side or they attach to like not quite the the, the apex part of the top um and the reason why that happens is for later on when the thing's growing, it needs uh, to be able to, to develop down into an empty space, which is where the albumin and all that crap is. If the animals, if the eggs roll late in development, it can have an impact. But if it's the beginning of development, it doesn't appear to have an impact. That being said, I can flat out say, and if you see the pictures of our clutches of eggs from West Liberty, we absolutely put a line on top of the eggs and we make sure that the top of the egg stays at the top of the egg. And that's more because there are so many people interacting with those eggs that I want later on. <laughs> if someone pulls an egg box out or to put another clutch in and then they see things rolling and it's late in development, I want people to know where the hell the top of the egg was so that I can go in there when they're you know two thirds of the way through and make sure everybody's set up properly. So. We do it just because of that. Um, yeah. All right. So um, incubation temperatures for your eggs and, in, and, and, and what you actually incubate the eggs in. So I've heard you talk about this. So, you know, I just bought a seed yeah, so... incubator. I dropped a whole bunch of money. And the entire time I was doing it, I was thinking about the way Matt most incubates his eggs. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> well... So I've made a few changes this year. We'll see respectively how it does change things. Um, But, you know, respective of the animals, I tend to incubate at a cooler temperature. Mm -hmm. And I do that respective because in in my experience, I've had larger hatchlings because they're able to absorb the yolk completely. and typically, you know, if it's old world rat snakes, I'm typically incubating around uh, anywhere from 70 to 74 degrees. And then for North American species or um, pythons, um, I'm typically in the low 80s. And I don't really cook the eggs. If they take longer, they take longer. I mean, for instance, some people for porphyracea, they hatch eggs in 60 days. I'm typically looking at an extended incubation period. So I'm at, you know, 90 plus days for incubation off of it. So you do add some time to the incubation process. In years past, um, I've used hovabaters, yes. which are chicken incubators. Mm-hmm. And the respective aspect of that is for any of this, they do create a good incubator. Um, and it's because it's very simplified. It's very, um, identified in terms of gas exchange. And I'll leave a cup of water inside of that too, as well, to help with, um, moisture as well as oxygen flow throughout the respective area. Um, this past year, uh, Billy from the Herpetoculture Uh. Network, uh, he talked me into a, sea serpents incubator Uh, oh okay um and i told billy that based on my success if i 
have an awful year. It's all because of him. There you go. <laughs> so no pressure added, right? <laughs> uh, no, I did it for a few reasons. Um, one is respective of space. And when I've used hover baiters, um, I typically have 20 hover baiters yeah. set up on a baker's rack. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at trying to simplify my process a little bit this year. Nice. Um, but if you are a introductory um, breeder starting into it, hover baiters make a great starting incubator for any, any species of reptilia. Yeah. Um, they're lower cost um, and they're very simplified in terms of their process for incubation. Um, but off of that nature, um, that's kind of one of my approaches and one of my approaches having used hover baiters is I'm not putting all my eggs in one box and relying on a thermostatic <laughs> failure or temperature control aspect of it. Um, but you know, it, it really comes into the respective play. I have done the suspended incubation method, which you're talking about using like a egg crate aspect of laying the eggs on top of, mm -hmm. um, I've done the burying within different incubating, um, materials, but I, I typically use, um, that method. I have used some of the new reptile basics or red line science, um, trays too, as well. Cause mm -hmm. those are actually the trays that I incubate in is, um, those plastic, plastic, basically, um, containers of which we would transport animals inside of. And I, I like those personally because they're cost effective. Um, you can easily disinfect them, reuse them for multiple purposes. Um, I've hatched a number of different species inside of them and I've hatched a number of different species inside of hover baiters using those different techniques. Um, the aspects of which, you know, for airflow respective of it, um, I think it's appropriate to have good airflow in the incubation box as well as the incubator. Um, you know, some people use fridge styles, you know, make their own. Yep. Um, I've seen, you know, for chickens, right. They have certain bird incubators too, as well, that are basically a, um, cooler that's been modified with, um, some heat tape inside of it. And, you know, th there's a lot of different aspects of it, but I think one of the biggest things is you want to make sure that you have air exchange because yep. you don't want to build up a large number of carbon dioxide within there. Yep. So back in the day, before I got into the breeding piece, when I'd find a gravid snake and I wanted to see what the babies looked like, I would, this is the early 2000s, I would bring them in. They drop the clutch. I'd let mom go. And then I would put that clutch in a bunch of sphagnum moss. And then I would just simply put it in my dad's garage. So like, and it, you know, and then check on it repeatedly around 60 days. And then sure enough, I think I hatched a lot of snakes that way. So yeah, I think that in some regards, you can't overcomplicate this. I think the benefit of having a dedicated incubator is that you can have complete control over that. So you can clean it out and sterilize it. And, and then you have the thermostat. But I know a lot of people uh will get their clutches and their snake room holds at about 80 degrees and they just simply put each clutch into a plastic bin and then they put it on you know up near the ceiling of their room and they just have their clutches lined out that way and you know they're able to incubate so lots of ways to skin this cat um but uh when it comes to egg care maybe we'll do a i, th I think that we'll just keep this series going and maybe we'll just do a how do you start these little part of my language bastards because <laughs> feeding that's the one part of the colubri keeping I, that's why i love my false water cobras they come out and they're basically the size of a small boa um the itty bitty little colubrids of the world and getting them to eat Ugh. yeah but anyway well do you are you happy i think we've we've gone through this I, yeah i think we've kind of laid out some respective areas um you know, there's, there's a number of different aspects of which, you know, avenues you can go down within incubators, um, suspension methods, media. I think one of the biggest things is, you know, there are personal preferences and there's nothing wrong with trying new things. And that's Cujo in the background, basically going there nuts. Is. Going nuts. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, uh, yeah, this has been episode, I think we're at 14. So next time is 15th. But this was a fun one. 
I always like the episodes where we just chill out and have a conversation just amongst us, the two of us, and, and get some ideas out there. So just like with the brumation episode, if there was some, you know, something we didn't talk about that you wanted us to talk about, send us a message uh, and we'll happily address it as a great example. When we did the brumation episode, um, Chris Montra or sorry, Montross messaged me. It was like, well, what about subtropical things and rain? So we address that the next episode so and i know that there were things we didn't talk about with this uh but i hope you like it if you like these biology snake biologies merged into herpetoculture episodes just give us different ideas and we're always willing to do deep dives i do want to plug a book um there's the phrase oldie but a goodie uh and this is certainly that this book was published i think in 19... 19- 87 yeah but it it's my go-to for the resource material for these episodes it's called snakes ecology and evolutionary biology and it's a great review of the literature up until then it gives you a really good foundation obviously the book's over 30 years old now uh, and there's been plenty of advances Um, but if you just want a resource to go to to understand the reproductive cycles of all snakes so pythons colubrids colubroids boas um this was done by pretty much the 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 people that are now uh the current herpetologists stand on their shoulders so uh i love this book you can get it used and it's only like 20 dollars. it should be in my opinion 500 dollars because it's a pretty damn good resource but it's relatively cheap so highly recommend that one if you're looking for something and then another really good book is how snakes work uh, that's the book that I make my grad students that are working on the snakes buy and they have to read it the first month they're in my program because I want them to know how snakes work. Uh, and it's really, really good. So, but with that being said, uh, we are done. So if you want to find us, we have our podcast, Facebook page and Instagram page, which is Colubrid and Colubroid radio. So go there and like us. And we always announce when the episodes are dropping there. And we occasionally will put up pictures of, of things that are relevant to our collections or um, random uh, articles or, or things on the internet we find that we think are, are pretty interesting and cool. If you want to find me, I'm Dr. Crawdad on Instagram um, and then Zach Lofman on Facebook. And I encourage anyone to reach out that wants to. So Matt, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Serpamitra on Facebook and Serpamitra USA on Instagram. Alrighty, so this is episode 14 in the books. Everybody have a great day, night, or morning, whatever time it is you're listening to this, and catch you later.